Travis, the chimp. On February 16th, 2009, a chimpanzee known as Travis attacked, seriously injuring and disfiguring his owner's friend, Carla Nash. Back in 1995, Travis was purchased by Sandra Harold and her husband Jerome for $50,000 when he was only three days old. He was said to be very socialized growing up with the Heralds and accompanying them to work at the towing company they owned as well as shopping in town. He was said to be able to open doors with keys, dress himself, log into computers, and use the TV remote. After the Herald's son died in 2000, and Jerome passed away in 2004, Sandra began to treat Travis like her child, even sleeping and bathing with him. On February 16, 2009, however, Travis would get a hold of Sandra's car keys and run out of the house. After struggling to wrangle Travis, Sandra would end up calling 55-year-old Carla Nash for help to try to get Travis back in the house. There are multiple theories as to why what happened next transpired, but the bottom line was that when Travis saw Carla, despite having been familiar with her since she also worked at the Herald's towing company, became enraged and brutally attacked her. Sandra, who was 70 years old at this point, attempted to stop him but was ultimately unable to do so, even after reportedly hitting him in the head with a shovel and stabbing him in the back with a butcher knife. Travis, however, would only become more aggressive as a result. Sandra retreated to her truck where she made this chilling 911 call. It's time for 911, where's your emergency? Oh, this is Sandy, 231 Rock, Rock Crimmon Road. What's Send the problem? The police. Send the police. What's the problem there? The, the, the chip killed my, my friend. What's the problem with your friend? Oh, please. What's the problem with your friend? I need to know. Send the police up with a gun. With a gun. Hurry you're, you're up. Who has a gun? Please hurry up. He's killing my girlfriend. What is the problem? He's killing my friend. Who's killing your friend? Chip, my chimpanzee. Oh, your chimpanzee please. is killing your friend. Yes. He ripped their part. Hurry up! With a gun. Hurry up, please! There's someone on the way. With guns, please! You shoot him! What is the monkey doing? Tell me what the monkey. He, he ripped their face off. He ripped their face off. He tried to try to attack me. Please, please! Okay, hurry. I need you to calm down a little bit. They're on the way. Can you push yourself away? I don't want the monkey attacking you. Please, hurry up! Listen to me. Uh, they're on the way, ma'am. They gotta shoot him, please. Please. If the monkey moves away from your friend, let me know, okay? So we could try I, to help your friend. No, no, I can't. She's dead. She's dead. Why Why are you saying that she's dead? She's dead. He ripped her apart. He ripped what apart? Her face? My, everything. Oh, he ripped her apart? Listen, I think I'm going to sleep. I think I'm going to pass no, out. No, just breathe, okay? I'm going to stay I with you on the phone until they get there. Listen, <laughs> please hurry. Please, please hurry. <laughs> oh, my God. Is the monkey still by your friend, or can you get close to your friend? He's eating her. He's eating her. Please. God, no, please. Okay, I need you to calm down for me. I know it's hard, okay? I know it's hard. But they're going as fast as they can your way, okay? Oh, my God. Please. Please tell him to shoot him. They did, Sandra. They're shooting at him already, okay? But he's not dead. I know. They will continue until he's dead, okay? I just need you to stay on the phone with me and breathe. He's not dead. He's not dead. He's not dead. Oh, God. Oh, God. When police arrived, Travis would approach them, attempting to open the cruiser's passenger and driver's side doors. After successfully opening one, he would be shot four times by one of the responding officers. Travis would finally end up retreating back to the house, where he would be found dead next to his cage. Sandra initially made the phone call after believing Travis had killed Carla, but miraculously, she actually survived. Although miraculous might not be the best word to use, as she would sustain injuries described as horrendous by the emergency crew, and would go through over seven hours of surgeries the following days. 
the paramedics would report that she had lost her lips, eyes, nose, and mid-face bone structure. She would also lose her hands, receive significant brain tissue injuries, and need her jaw to be reattached. As a result of her injuries, it was also announced that she would be blind for the rest of her life. Carla would sue Sandra for $50 million in 2009. Sandra would pass away suddenly in 2010. Nash would get an experimental face and hand transplant in 2011 and settle with Sandra's estate in 2012 for $4 million. I won't be sharing any photos of Carla after the attack, although they do exist. But I will show you this one of her in 2016, several years after the face transplant. Today, she says she has no lasting pain from the attack and tries to live as independently as possible. Sean Great's Victim On September 13th, 2016, 911 dispatchers received a call from a woman claiming to be the victim of a kidnapping. In fact, she only spoke to the person in whispers because at that very moment, she was still in the process of being held against her will. But quite possibly the scariest part of all is the fact that at the time of the call, the victim was in bed with the kidnapper while he slept next to her. Take a listen. 911, what is the address to your emergency? I just lost street laundry mat. What is it? Or street laundry mat. What's the problem? I've been exhausted. What's your name? How do you spell your last name? Who abducted you? John Green. You said John Green? Sean Great. Where's she at now? Asleep. Where's she sleeping at? In the bedroom. And his name is Sean Great? Yes. Like G R A T E? Yes. Does he have a weapon? Are you injured? A little. What color is his hair? Brown. Do you know what color his eyes are? No. What's he wearing? Nothing right now. Is there any way you can get out of the building? I don't know without waking him and I'm scared. Is there a bathroom in the, the house? Well, his bedroom is closed and he made it so it would make noise. And if you told him you had to go to the bathroom, he would do something to you? Yeah, because he had me tied up. So are you tied up now? Well, I... Yeah, but I kind of freed myself. Can you get to the door where you can see out? Huh? Yeah. Can you get out of the house? It's locked. It's locked. Are you at the door? Yeah, I am. She's at the door. You're on the door to the right-hand side of the house. Yeah. She's at the door on the right side of the house. She got out of the bedroom. Hurry up, hurry up, get out of here. Where is he? Still sleeping? Still sleeping? Yeah. Okay, they have her. He went on arms. On arms? Yeah. The woman, who was a victim of assault, would not have her identity revealed by police. 
However, they would find her captor, Sean Michael Great. The victim said Great was like an older brother to her. The two would share lunch, play tennis, and even discuss the Bible together. Great would attempt on several occasions to form some kind of relationship with the victim, either emotionally or physically, but the victim would always reject his advances, reportedly even refusing to give Great her phone number, but otherwise likely considered Great a friend, and said Great seemed to respect her boundaries. That was, however, until September 11th, 2016, when Great convinced her to come with him to his house in order to retrieve some items. When inside, his entire personality reportedly changed as he pulled the Bible from her hands and began to beat and choke her. He would then restrain the victim and assault her for the following days, using various methods and restraining her in various positions. I see some reports suggesting that he even put her in a restraint that he claimed would strangle her if she tried to escape it, as well as claimed to rig the house to make noise if she tried to leave. The victim endured this abuse for around three days before finally being able to escape one of the restraints put on her by Great and use a phone to call the police. Again, the entire time during the call, laying in bed with Great. Thankfully, however, the victim would be rescued by police and Sean Great would be arrested. Things would only get worse, however, as it would be discovered that Great was actually a serial killer. While in custody, Great admitted to the killing of five women between the years of 2006 to 2016. Based on my research, it seems that he would only end up being convicted of four of the murders, but he would still have around 23 charges, including aggravated murder. More than enough for the Ashland County prosecutor to seek the death penalty, which they would successfully get, resulting in Great's execution being scheduled for March of 2025. Great would send a letter to the news claiming that he only targeted people on government assistance, claiming once they started receiving their checks, they were basically dead bodies just flopping around. His mother, in an interview, would also call him charming and good-looking, before adding that so was the devil. Nashville, Tennessee break-in. On Monday, June 29, 2015, Two sisters from Nashville, Tennessee were home alone when they started to hear a banging at the door around 9.15 that morning. But it wasn't a banging like someone attempting to knock and get the homeowner's attention. It was a banging like someone trying to force their way into the home. What's worse is that the banging seemed to be coming from the home's back door. And when they peeked out of the kitchen window, they saw two men dressed in black. Thinking quickly, the two sisters, aged 16 and 13, ran to their parents' bathroom as the oldest called the police. Um, there's two men outside my house. I think they're trying to break in. They must have got home alone. I have been on the line with me. I'm getting help started to you, okay? Okay. Can you see um, what they look like? They were knocking on the door. One had long hair, kind of, and I don't, I'm not sure about the other one. Okay, was, were they white, black, or Hispanic? Um, I think they're white. Yeah. Okay, and where are you? We're wearing my pants after. Where Where are you inside the house? Um, we're, we're in the very back with my parents' bedroom bathroom. Please hurry. Okay, I'm getting them started, okay? Okay, what door are they at? The very back. It's a small house. Okay, so, so the two men are at the back door? Yeah. Okay. I have some calls set up. We do have officers that are en route to you, okay? They're in the house? Are they in the house? Okay. I want you to be very quiet, okay? I'm on the line with you. I have help on the way. Where is he? Okay, don't don't come out yet. Okay. 
okay? Um, I have officers who are clearing your house, okay? I want you to still remain quiet until they come in there with you, okay? Don't be afraid. Okay. We're here. We're back here. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. As heard in the audio, the men would end up gaining entry to the home while the sisters were tucked away inside a linen closet in the back of the bathroom. While attempting to remain hidden, they could hear the men ransacking the home, unaware to them, however, that the police were on their way. When the police arrived, one man would attempt to drive away in a car and was ultimately stopped by officers. Shockingly, the other man would end up attempting to lock himself in the bathroom. Yes, the bathroom where the two sisters were hiding. The older sister said she thought that he was going to end up opening the cabinet and find them, but luckily, he never did. Instead, he would try to run for it before being captured by police as well. The two men would be later identified as 31-year-old Brian Tumberland and 29-year-old Carlos Murillo. Both individuals also have a history of run-ins with the law. It was reported that Brian was the one who attempted to drive away before running on foot, for which he was ultimately charged with aggravated burglary, possession of burglary tools, felony evading arrest, and driving on a revoked license. That means Carlos was the one who hid in the bathroom and was charged with aggravated burglary and possession of burglary tools. The police also reportedly found money, jewelry, musical instruments, a computer, and a shotgun in the getaway vehicle, all stolen from the sister's home. Although I couldn't find specific information on the two's sentencing, I was able to discover that Brian, as of 2019 at the latest, was not incarcerated, and as far as I could tell, seemed to have turned his life around. Carlos also seemed to be released no later than 2019, but I was unable to find any information on his current status only that he might currently be living in San Antonio, Texas, or at the very least, had just been there at one point. But despite that, it is undoubtedly thanks to the sister's quick thinking that things did not end up much, much worse. With the older sister reminding us that we all think that it will never happen to you, until it does. Before we see the next entry, I asked my subscribers if they thought that when in an emergency, calling 911 was the fastest way to receive help. 71% of you said yes, but 29% still thought that there was a faster way, like user Tony J. Dietz, who basically said that when you are properly trained and can safely do so, in his opinion, self-defense will always be the fastest option. If you want to be a part of the next poll and have a chance to get your comment featured in next week's video, subscribe down below so you don't miss it. Chuckington Sinclair On October 26, 2014, a man by the name of Chuckington Sinclair called 911 to report that he had just committed a murder. The victim, his pregnant wife, who he claimed came at him with a knife, forcing him to act in self-defense. 911, please fire ambulance. Uh, yes, hello? Hi, 911, do you need the police or the ambulance? Um, yes, yes, ma'am, I need the police. To what address? What's going on there? Um, a murder has been committed. Oh, a murder has been committed? By who? By me, ma'am. By you? Yes, ma'am. Who did you murder? I murdered my wife. When? Around 7 this morning. Okay, and what's your name? Checkington Sinclair. Checkington? Yes. Okay. Is she still there? Yes, she's still here. Why did you do this? Um, we got into an argument and she came at me with the knife. And so you shot her? I mean, I was like I could defend myself. She was just on the... She was really... She was 
just be one of those happens in life. I thought there was going to be police officers come over and just handle this. Okay, well, they're going to be there in just a little bit. I'm still here. Hello? I'm still here. Okay. It's up to you. If you want to stay on the phone with me, that's fine. I'll just say so, please. I'll show you here now. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Sinclair claimed that he acted in self-defense, and the crime scene corroborated this story. However, upon investigation, the police or coroner seemed to notice some discrepancies. The biggest issue was that Sinclair, again, claimed that his wife came at him with a knife and he discharged his weapon, hitting her in the head. But they would discover that the body actually had two bullet wounds, one graze, and one that entered in the back of the head. I won't pretend to be an expert in the law, but generally speaking, self-defense does not include attacking someone if their back is turned, even if they are threatening you with bodily harm even seconds prior. That was when it was revealed that Sinclair had actually become enraged with his wife, whom he had been married to for less than a year and was reportedly seven weeks pregnant, when she received a text message from an old ex-boyfriend. After committing the crime, Sinclair would then reportedly spend hours staging the crime scene in order to better tell the story that he wanted to tell, and called 911 many hours after the incident occurred. He would ultimately confess to these crimes and be charged and found guilty of first-degree premeditated murder of his 24-year-old wife, Atwasha Arget, and the murder of her unborn child. He would also be found guilty of tampering with evidence. As a result, Sinclair would be sentenced to two consecutive life sentences, an automatic sentence for each murder charge, under Florida law since they did not seek the death penalty. Sinclair, who was only 25 years old at the time of his sentencing, reportedly sent a few text messages shortly after the crime. One to his brother and mother, letting them know that he loved them. And one to a friend, letting him know that he wouldn't be able to participate in this upcoming fantasy football season. Don Spirit On September 18th, 2014, 911 operators in Florida received a call from an individual identifying themselves as Don Spirit. Don had spent time in jail after accidentally shooting and killing his son Kyle while on a hunting trip, but now he was confessing to something much, much worse. Take a listen. Thank you, Chris County 911. What's the address of the emergency? Yes, ma'am. I, I, um, I just shot my daughter and shot all my grandkids, and I'll be sitting on my step, and when you get here, I'm going to... What is the address that you're at, sir? 2550 Northwest, 25 Terrace, downstairs. They're, they're, every one of them are dead. Uh, you said your name is Don Spirit? Yep. All right, Don, what kind of gun do you have? It doesn't matter what kind of gun I got, they're all dead, and then when you get here, I'll and then you figure out what kind of gun it is. And how long has this happened, Don? I, I don't, I don't want to hear it, man. I'm done with all, every fucking thing. Just bring the motherfuckers out here, that's all. We got all the kids are dead in the house. Okay, how many people? Okay, how many people? Six kids, one adult. Six kids and one adult? Yeah. One of them is a baby. All right, Don, is there any way you can stay on the phone with me until I get somebody there to help you? What's that? Can I ha have you stay on the phone with me? No, I, no, not that. I'm waiting for them to get here. When they get here, I'm going to stay on my back step. All I'm doing is waiting for them. Can you stay on your back steps? Yep. Based on the call, it seems that Don, who was 51 at the time, had admitted to using a weapon he had obtained to end the lives of his daughter, 28-year-old Sarah Spirit, and all six of his grandchildren, including 11-year-old Caleb, 9-year-old Kylie, 
eight-year-old Jonathan, five-year-old Destiny, four-year-old Brandon, and Sarah's newborn, Elena, who is only two and a half months old. On top of this, he also requested for police to come to his house, at which point he would Unfortunately, this would end up being the truth, as when Deputy David Anderholt arrived on scene and ordered Don to come outside and show him his hands, he instead repeated that Sarah and the children were dead, and pointed to a tarp in the front yard, telling the deputy that Sarah's body was under it. Only seconds later, Don would It is unclear exactly why he committed the horrible crimes he did, but seemed to blame the Stewart family for his actions telling police prior to his death that he blamed the Stewart family, and specifically Colleen Stewart, the aunt of the father to three of Sarah's children, for making Sarah a promiscuous drug addict, saying that they ruined his family and ruined his life, going on to add that he was tired of them all. Although it is unclear if he meant the Stewarts or specifically Sarah and her children. The news of these tragic events quickly spread through the small town of Bell, Florida, which only had around 350 residents, and people were quick to note Don's lengthy criminal record, leading all the way back to 1998 for felony possession of marijuana, as well as several other incidents of being a felon in possession of a weapon. The school superintendent did confirm that five of Sarah's children did attend the local elementary school in grades ranging from preschool to fifth grade. The children's respective teachers also stated that they were placed on the bus at 3 p.m., meaning that the unfortunate events that transpired happened only two hours later. Well, that's it for now. Be sure to like the video to help the algorithm and subscribe to see more content like this. If you enjoyed this video, why not check out this one where I talk about five pranks that turned deadly. I'll see you next time.